What up? Welcome, welcome, welcome to Covenant Church. Thank you so much. You can be seated. I want to take a moment to greet everybody watching online, all of our first time visitors. If uh, you didn't mean to come to church today, maybe your friend told you they were taking you to brunch and they brought you here. I'm not sorry. I'm so glad that you uh, would spend um, an hour of your weekend with us. So we're continuing the summer reading series. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about a book I wrote called Unoffendable. I want us to look um, at Matthew chapter 18. If you have no idea who Matthew is, he was um, not a church person at first. But Jesus walked up to him and said, follow me, and he decided to follow Jesus, and he tells some of the greatest stories about the life of Jesus, and in one of the uh, chapters he wrote, he says this, starting in verse 21, Bible says this, then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say up to you seven times, but up to 70 times times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and he seized him and began to choke him. You ever had somebody owe you so much money you started to choke him? Then said, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison. I ain't never heard of another slave throwing another slave in prison, but that's another story for another day. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity we have to gather as a community of faith. Lord, I pray that today you would show us how to let go of past hurts. Teach us today how to be unoffendable. In Jesus' name I pray, everybody said amen. Um, this is a, a picture of me and my father. Um, my father had a stroke um, in about fifth grade, so by the time I was able to drive, my dad had lost a lot of his motor skills and couldn't drive, and so I became my dad's Uber driver for the, for the rest of his life. And, and my dad always liked to go to the same place. It, it, he only, went, only wanted to go one place. It was right down the street from my house. It was always my dad wanted to go to Walmart. Okay? My dad loved him some Walmart. Okay? My dad did therapy in Walmart. My dad prayed for people in Walmart. My dad just loved walking the aisles of Walmart. And every time we went to Walmart, it was a three or four hour trip. Okay? One time, I, I surprised my parents in Atlanta. Walked in the house. Bam! My mom said, oh my gosh, Ryan, you're here. This is so awesome. Give me a big hug. My dad looks at me and he says, Ryan, can you take me to Walmart? I said, hey, man, it's good to see you, too. Okay, I said, all right, let's do a field trip, y'all. Let's piled up my parents in my rental car and said, let's go to Walmart. Now, because I know my parents like to spend all day in Walmart, I parked in the hazardous section and put the hazard lights on. My parents said, why aren't you parking? I said, because we're not going to be here all day. I want you to know I'm in a hazardous situation, so you need to hurry up, okay? Like TikTok. Like, you, you don't got that much stuff to get. 45 minutes later. My mom walks out of Walmart. She only had two things in her bag, laundry detergent and some cocoa butter. I said, Mom, how did it take you 45 minutes to get two items? Also, where's Dad? She's like, I don't know. I lost him. How'd you lose Dad? Okay, he is 6'3", 250 pounds. Okay, like this is a hard man to lose. Mama, this is what I need you to do. I need you to stay right here. 
don't go nowhere. I'm going to get that. I'm hot. I've been here an hour and a half now. I'm walking up and down every hour. I'm like, when I find this man, his cart better be full. It better have a TV, a dresser. He better have, I mean, this thing better be packed high, okay? I found my dad in the towel aisle. Only thing he had in his cart was a two liter of ginger ale and a Snickers bar. I said, I'm about to blow this place up. I'm about to blow it up. I'm like, you're driving me crazy, man. I'm like, dad, what are you doing? He goes, I'm looking for your mother. I said, I'm gonna kill somebody today. <laughs> She's out, to, let's, let's go. We've been here two hours, man. So we buy the stuff, we get outside, and you know the rest of this story. <laughs> My mama was gone. I said, somebody gonna call the police? Somebody got to call the police. I know my mom didn't get kidnapped. I know she didn't get kidnapped. I know she then stole my rental car. I said, I look back at my dad. He pulled out a Snickers bar all slow. <laughs> Where's your mother? You said she was outside. Listen, I'm not messing with you today, okay? When she gets back, she's gonna get an earful. No answer. No answer. My mom showed back up 30 minutes later. I said, Ma, where have you been? She said, I got thirsty. So I went to a gas station down the street to get something to drink. I said, <laughs> we at Walmart. They got more drinks here than any gas station in the city of Atlanta. Whenever you see Jesus use this term in the Bible, he will always um, do this. He'll say, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to. In other words, what he's trying to say is, let me tell you what it's like with that. Let me tell you what a day in the life of my house with my father is like. And Peter, and my house, this is how things are with dad. We let go of stuff. We, 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 just, we, we just let go. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And, and Peter is, is trying to do something really special with Jesus. He's going, okay, Jesus, how many times should I forgive somebody who sinned against me. You must understand that the greatest rabbis taught that the most times you should forgive somebody was three times. Three strikes and you're out, okay? So Peter is, is, isn't just asking a question. He is trying to get brownie points with the Lord and Savior, Jesus. Hey, guys, his favorite number is seven for perfection. I got this. <clears throat> hey, Jesus, how many times should we forgive somebody who sinned against us? Seven times. He says, no, 70 times seven. Okay, for those of you who aren't good at math, that's 490 times. To which Peter would have to respond, Jesus, who's gonna count to 490? Like, like what spouse in here is going, you know what? You didn't hurt me 463 times. You got 27 more strikes and you're out, buddy. I'm telling you. Because you would never do that. By the time you started counting, you would lose count. Jesus is going, yeah, that's the point. I want you to lose count. I want you to stop counting. Because with me and dad, we just let stuff go. Um, scholars also tell us that 10,000 talents in today's economy would be worth anywhere between 12 million and a billion dollars. In other words, this was a debt that this man could not repay even if he wanted to. Yet he decided to just let it go. This is very good news if you showed up here today and you've been told that God has been against you your whole life. This is very good news for you today if you thought that the gathering of God's people, that church in general is against who you are. What you gotta understand is Jesus is setting the record straight for everybody who's ever thought that he's going, hey, at my house, forgiveness is available for anybody. And I extend it to people that don't deserve it. And you know what breaks my heart? Is that I'm, I sit and talk with people and have coffee with people that are going through so much pain. And when you start to talk about the root of their pain, they're still responding to something that happened to them in the 90s. I'm like, you still mad? about what happened in 1997. I was 11 years old at the time. And that's, that's why you're treating people like this? Because of what your dad did 20 years ago? 
And here's what you must understand. There is an adversary of your soul. And the enemy of your soul wants to take decades of your life. Upset at the wrong people. I wonder who's in the building today that is extremely close to the wrong people, yet the enemy has somehow put distance between you and the right people. I know siblings that have not spoken to each other in years over some small beef, and they just don't want to let it go. You know, the Bible says that a brother is born for adversity. And the enemy's plan is that when you experience adversity, you are all by yourself. And God's plan for everybody's life in this room and everybody, all of my friends that are watching online is that you would have close brothers and sisters that in a time of, of adversity to go, hey, there's no space between us. We can talk about it because all of us have experienced some type of pain or hurt or offense from one person or another. Sometimes it's something somebody said. They discouraged you. They told you you weren't enough, that you weren't pretty enough, that you weren't rich enough. All of us have had a boss that we just go, man, I just don't feel appreciated. I don't feel this. And we fill in the blank. We've all had a, a romantic relationship where there was some sort of, of strife. Sometimes it's not just something that they said. Sometimes it's something that they did. They cheated on you. They cheated on your mom. They failed you on that test. They never put you in the game. They voted for somebody differently than you. They unfollowed you on social media. Whatever the case may be, you can find yourself in this room going, Ugh, with somebody in your world that God actually wants you to be close to, that God actually wants to heal that relationship. Today, I, I want to teach you how to be unoffendable. Unoffendable doesn't mean that you won't get offended. Unoffendable means you won't stay offended. You're not gonna stay there. You can get mad, but when you stay mad for 25 years, look what the enemy just did. That's not God, and I'm not excusing what they did, but you got a choice to make today. The first step into being unoffendable and how to let go of past hurts is number one, you have to recognize your own need for forgiveness. You have to recognize your own need for forgiveness because we can all fall prey to being the victim when we are hurt and then we quickly forget all of the pain that we have also inflicted on other people. What I know about you and what I know about me is that hurt people have also hurt people. They've also done the deed. And when you can recognize your own need for forgiveness, it's going to be much easier to pass it on to somebody else. Josh mentioned this during our worship time. It's Romans chapter five, verse six. It says, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ did not die for us when we got our act together, when we were singing the right songs, when we memorized the right Bible verses. No, when you were having a good old time with somebody you shouldn't have been having a good time with, Christ died for you right in that moment. That's good news for you. That's good news for you. And, and some of you have done some things. You know God forgives you, but you haven't forgiven yourself. And you have walked around with a life full of guilt and shame about what you've done. You've kept your own score of your own spiritual stats. And you're going, man, I'm not good enough because I'll never be close. I'll never be a church person because my favorite author is uh, Brene Brown. She says it like this. Guilt tells you what you did. Shame tells you you are what you did. What I want you to know today is this. It's not shame on you, it is shame off you. You are not what you have done, you are what Christ has done for you. And that's the best news you're gonna get all summer. It's not until you can fully receive the forgiveness of a heavenly father, an unearned forgiveness, that you can extend it to somebody you think, I'm not gonna forgive them. But, it's, but once 
once you really understand what you have done, once you really look at all the stuff that you've done, all the things that you've been thinking, all the stuff, all of your darkness, when you realize that that was wiped clean, man, it's going to be hard to not forgive other people around you. But I can always tell when someone has lost sight of their own darkness, when they start stepping into their own self-righteousness, they just need, they, they didn't have a little spiritual amnesia. They, that's, they, 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 done, they done forgot who they used to be without the grace of God. But if you just remember that for a moment, you'll go, you'll move on to, to step number two. Extend the same grace that's been extended to you. Extend the same grace that's been extended to you. Ladies and gentlemen, what you must understand this morning is that forgiven people have a responsibility to forgive. In other words, I'm not forgiving you because I'm a nice guy. I'm forgiving you because someone else let me off the hook. Imagine if um, I told you right now there was um, $101 bills underneath your seat. Don't check, it's not there, okay? <laughs> but let's just say it was. And I said, hey, me and Amanda, we balling. We got it. We just want to bless y'all, go have some fun. And on the way out, there was a homeless man in the parking lot, and he said, can I have $5 to get something to eat? And you were like, no! You wouldn't do that. Why? Because something was freely given to you that you did not earn. So, of course, well, well of course I could give it. It's, it, it's not... It's not mine, neither is forgiveness, because you didn't earn that either. So give it away freely. Give it away. Give it away. Matthew 5 in the message says this. It says, this is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter into a place of worship and are about to make an offering, and you suddenly remember a grudge against a friend that has against you, abandon your offering. Leave immediately, go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then come back and work things out with God. Now, here's the deal. We already took up the offering, so nobody move, okay? <laughs> but what Jesus is saying is he's, he's going, your worship to me, your connection with me, the evidence of that is how you treat other people. So you, you can't get self-righteous and go, man, church is good today, boy. Woo, got the boy. That worship team was on fire today. Woo. And you, you, you have this spiritual high in this moment. No, 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 no. The evidence of the spiritual high is how you treat somebody when you're spiritually low. When you go, you know what? It might feel good to forgive somebody at 10 a.m., but your real battle is going to be at 10 p.m. Tonight and tomorrow, when you all of a sudden have to love someone that is difficult, Jesus said some crazy things in red, y'all. You know what he said one time? He said, love your enemy. Then he moved. He said, bless those who curse you. What? Somebody cussed me out? You're not getting money from me. I'm not about to bless you because you cursed me. What? And then thirdly, he said, I want you to pray for those who persecute you. Jesus, let's just talk for a second. I barely pray for people I like. Real talk. Okay, what makes you think I'm going to put her on the list? What makes you think I'm going to put him on the list? Like, Jesus, you mean to tell me this person that is against me in my home, this person that is against me at my job, this person that is against me at my school, you want me to add them to my prayer list? Yes, because I added you to a list you didn't belong on. I put you on a VIP list when you couldn't get in the door. Yes, that's exactly what I want you to do. And here's what I've learned. The longer you pray for somebody you don't like, the longer you pray for somebody that's offended you, it's going to be hard to not fall in love with that person. You want to know why? Because the first day you pray for them, you'd be like, hey, Lord, I pray for, I don't even want to say her name because her attitude <laughs> is just out of control. So, Lord, I just pray you would just fix her attitude all the way from the top of her head to the sole of her feet, Jesus. Oh, and for this dude I was, they, now listen, Lord, help him get a J-O-B, okay? He need to get his whole life together. Help him get out of his mama's. I mean, you start, you be praying petty, okay? That's the first time. That's the first time. But the second time is different. Because the longer you keep praying for them, 
the more you're going to catch God's heart for that person. So now Susie Q, who got attitude at the job, you, you, before you start praying, you're going to start asking questions to God and start going, Lord, why is she hurting? Maybe her hurting me actually isn't about me. Maybe the hurt that she's experienced, that I'm experiencing, is a result of something somebody else did. So, Lord, would you give me divine insight to how to help this person that seems to be against me? But really, they're just in a lot of pain from something that happened in the 90s. So, Lord, would you heal the parts of them that are broken the most? Now your heart's changed. Because now you have the heart of God pumping on the inside of you, all because you added somebody you didn't like to your prayer list. Um, your, your greatest opportunity to be like Jesus is when somebody has hurt you. People say, I wanna be like Jesus. Well, your, your moment's coming. <laughs> I guarantee it. And when that moment comes, you have an opportunity to actually be like Jesus. Man, and this, this third point is it's a lifestyle choice. I encourage everybody to adopt this lifestyle, and I promise you when you do, you will live so much lighter and so much freer. And number three is this. You have to decide to forgive people before they hurt you. You have to decide to forgive people before they hurt you. If you wait to the moment that they hurt you to decide how you're going to react to it, it is too late for you to be the person you actually want to be. Because you're just going to respond in anger. You're just going to be in your feelings and, just gonna go, and you're just going to vomit emotionally on everybody. But if you've already made a decision, you can go, you know what? I've been expecting you this week. In fact, Colossians 3 says this. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Who's anyone? That includes your spouse and everybody, okay? Um, remember. The Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Paul is encouraging us to walk around in our back pocket with a little bit of allowance of grace for everybody. He says, hey, keep, 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 keep a little margin back there. Leave a gap for people to make mistakes. The way I translate that is this. Expect people to be stupid, okay? So here's the deal. This week, you need to walk into work. Somebody going to do it today. <laughs> Somebody going to do it today. Somebody gonna act a fool. I don't know if it's gonna be you. I don't know if it's gonna be you. But I don't know if it's gonna be you. But guess what? Grace is waiting for you. And the moment they offend you, you can go, I've been waiting for you. I knew, I knew it was gonna come. But I've already made my decision how I'm gonna respond before it happens. And I'm gonna extend a lot of grace anyways. Um, in my home, um, my wife gives me lots of grace for, for my faults, and I think my wife has learned to expect me to do something stupid every week. It's just a, it's just a given. Um, my wife is 100% amazing, 98% perfect. Now, let me tell you about that 2% real fast, okay? Um, I have gotten permission from her to, to share this story, so just everybody, easy. Um, we, uh, <clears throat> we've been, uh, we just celebrated five years of marriage uh, just a couple, week, a couple weeks ago. And uh, during the five years, I've been praying for my wife to be delivered from a particular activity that she's been doing that um, I don't have many pet peeves, but this is one of them. And I've just been trying to break every chain in my home. <laughs> and somehow the prayers are being blocked. I don't know what's going on with me and the Lord, but... Um, I, I, I'm, I just, there's this one thing, Doug, one thing. I'm just like, can, I, don't, I don't ask for much, Doug, one thing. My wife likes to uh, move cell phone chargers. <laughs> My cell phone chargers. Specifically, the one by my nightstand, you know? So when I come home, go to bed, just want to charge up the phone and... Hey, babe, I mean, I know I didn't move the cell phone charger. Our son's three and a half. He, he didn't move the cell. There's only one person here, unless you're going to try and say the Holy Spirit, but he did it. It was you. Like, where's my cell phone charger? Oh, I don't know. I needed it. 
you don't look very motivated to like find it though. And then tomorrow you're going to call me and be like, why didn't you answer the phone? But like my phone died and I would have been able to call you back if I'd have been able to charge my phone. Like, so my best friend called me and said, hey man, how are you and Amanda? I said, man, we beefing right now, man. I, I'm, I'm upset. I'm upset right now. He said, what's going on? I said, man, she keep moving the cell phone charges, bruh. Been married five years. I'm just like, what, what's the deal? He said, Ryan, why don't you just buy some more cell phone charges? I said, you see, that's why I don't like being your friend anyway, okay? Matter of fact, we're not friends no more. Get on my nerves. I always got something smart to say. And, and then I asked him, I said, hey, man, how are you and your wife? He said, well, you know, my wife's a little upset with me. I said, what'd you do? He said, she said to me this morning, I don't know how you have so much discipline and energy to go work out, but you don't have enough discipline to change the windshield wipers on our vehicle. I said, man, I'm kind of with her on this one, bro. I don't, I, don't, I don't know, you know? I'm trying to get you back, but I, I'm, I'm, this, this is some good logic here. And I said, hey, man, you know, when we weren't married like 10 years ago and we were friends, did you ever think 10 years from now that when we would be talking about tension in our marriage, that we'd be talking about windshield wipers and cell phone chargers? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's the small stuff that creates separation between us and the people we love. Windshield wiper problems and cell phone chargers, so silly. But isn't it amazing how much silly stuff gets in between us? and the people we love, it's not until someone voices it out loud that they go, like if you ever just have, a, a, I sit with tons of married people and I go, man, so tell me, what, tell me what's, what's going on. When they start voicing it, they start smiling because they realize. But if you can learn to deal with the small stuff, it gives you practice to deal with the big stuff. My father um, unfortunately passed away about three years ago. Do you know how much money I would spend right now to hear these simple words. Ryan, want to go to Walmart? And I wouldn't have parked in the hazard section. I would park and I would say, Dad, let's see what they got. Let's go up and down every aisle. Because tomorrow's not promised, ladies and gentlemen. Tomorrow's not promised for anybody. And some of us think, well, we're going to forgive them later. No, you won't. You need to start today. I'm not prescribing a pill that magically you're just going to be happy with everybody. No, today what I'm prescribing is that you start a journey of letting go of some of these things that are holding you back from your destiny. Some of us live with these forgiveness prerequisites. Like, I will forgive them when, and if they would just... And if, 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 they would, if they would notice me, if they would apologize, if they would... And we envision a better version of ourselves when they do their part. But what I want to encourage you with this morning is this. If there is a better version you envision yourself being after they get their act together, my simple question to you is this. Why wait? Why? Because I think you could be that person right now. I wouldn't wait for them. I would just start to move on with my life right now. I encourage you this morning, forgive them, forgive them, forgive your dad, forgive your mom, forgive your spouse, forgive your ex-spouse, forgive your kids, forgive that teacher, forgive that lawyer, forgive the president, forgive the police, forgive the government, whoever it is in your world that you're just going. Extend all of them, all of the above, the same grace that has been extended to you. I have two more questions for you, and they're very simple. Number one, who do you need to forgive? Who's the person? Is it a boss? Is it the person you're sitting next to? Who do you need to forgive? Not because they deserve it, but because you didn't deserve it. Let it go. Start that journey. It's not an overnight deal, but to start that journey, maybe you need to see a counselor and, and process your journey, but what you can't do is make the people you actually love pay for something somebody did a long time ago. 
It's an unfair way to live. Oh, man, can you imagine your life? If you were really unoffendable, where you go, hey, man, you know, I'm going to get offended, but I'm not going to stay here very long. I can vocalize the fact that I've, I've been hurt, but I'm not going to stay here. I'm not going to dwell on it. I'm not going to rehearse the lines and replay the things that you said to me over and over and over and over. Again, I'm just going to let it go. Number two, here's the second question. Is there anybody in your life that you need to go ask for forgiveness from? I have the sinking suspicion that a lot of us need to make some tough phone calls today. A lot of us have some interesting, tough emails to draft to say, I want to apologize for my part. And you might think that their part is bigger and they owe you an apology. But in light of the person you actually want to be, you go first. And you might only own 20% of the problem. Apologize for your 20%. Exaggerate it. Go 30. Go. I'll take even more blame. Why, why not? I, because I don't want to live my life not free. I don't want to celebrate the 4th of July freedom in our country and be bound on the inside. I don't want to be grilling burgers, celebrating the freedom in our country. And, but on the inside, I just can't see. I encourage you today, truly accept the forgiveness of a heavenly father. Extend that same grace to those around you and make a decision in your life. I'm going to decide how I'm going to treat people before I find out how they want to treat me. And I've decided I'm going to forgive people before they hurt me. Father, I thank you so much for this amazing church. I pray, God, that today we were truly receive all that you have for us, that we would truly receive your love for us and your forgiveness. Lord, you, you didn't have to do it. We don't deserve it whatsoever. Yet your reckless love has chased us down when we could not earn it. We thank you for that this morning. Lord, I pray that that exact same love, pray, Lord, we would extend it to those around us and that it would affect our lives in a dramatic way. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody say it.